I am very, very proud to be here today. As Hillel said, I'm Dr. Katrina Lantos Sweat. I am president of the Lantos Foundation for Human Rights and Justice, and I'm very proud to be the daughter of the late Congressman Tom Lantos. My father was the only survivor of the Holocaust ever elected to serve in the United States Congress, and he became one of my country's most eloquent and courageous champions for the cause of human rights worldwide. And to say that I am honored to be part of this gathering and in the presence of so many living heroes and heroines of the human rights movement would really be to understate my feelings. Many years ago, when I was a very young, newly minted lawyer, working on Capitol Hill for then Senator Joe Biden, I was being pursued by another young Capitol Hill staffer. And this young man, who shall remain nameless, and I'm sure he's very grateful that he shall remain nameless, had the distinction of having asked me the most thought-provoking pickup line that I was ever on the receiving end of. And for those of you who may not be quite as familiar with American slang, a pickup line is a line that typically a young man will use when he wants to ask somebody out on a date. And some of them are pretty funny and pretty lame, um, such as, oh, did it hurt? And the young lady sitting at the bar or at the reception says, what, excuse me? And the young man goes on to say, well, did it hurt when you fell? And the young woman says, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what you're talking about. And then he delivers the coup de grace. And he says, well, you're obviously an angel, and so you must have fallen from heaven. Did it hurt? So that's what a pickup line is. It's a way that you kind of try to get that, uh, that young woman that you would just love to take out to dinner um, interested in maybe, just maybe, saying yes. Well, this young man, who, as I say, shall remain nameless, did ask me the most memorable pickup line that I had ever heard. And it went something like this. He said, Katrina, if tonight, as you prepare to go to bed, the light in your room begins to grow brighter and brighter until it really is almost unbearably bright, and God suddenly appears there in your room and tells you, I will answer any single question that you want to ask me, what would you ask? Now, the plan was that I was going to give him my answer on our first date. And as I said, that date never happened. But I did think long and very hard about how I would use such a precious opportunity. I didn't want to ask a question that I probably already knew the answer to, what is the most important, the greatest thing in the world? Love. I probably already knew that. How can we really achieve world peace? I think I know the answer to that as well. Greater tolerance, forgiveness, mutual understanding. So in the end, I decided that if I had that precious opportunity, I would ask God a very personal question because I believe that to the extent that he works in this world, it is most often through us. And the question I determined that I would ask was, what will be the greatest moral challenge I will face in my life? And will I be equal to it? Will I meet it in a way that will make you proud? The three distinguished panelists I have the privilege of introducing this morning, John Dow, Adibo Youssef, and Luba Byangdeng, each have the peace of mind that comes from being able to know their answer to that question and that the answer was in the affirmative, that they met the great moral challenge of their life in a way that would make a creator proud. We are here this morning talking about genocide and crimes against humanity, and we are doing so in the context of Sudan, a country that has become almost a poster child for these most terrible of crimes. 
and where there has been really serial war waged for decades against the people of Sudan by their own government, against South Sudan, Darfur, Southern Kordofan, and the Nuba people, Abia, and so on. Sudan puts in very sharp relief many of the most challenging human rights problems the world faces. How do we achieve justice and accountability against perpetrators of the most grave of human rights violations? How do we make international human rights enforceable? How do we balance this need for accountability and justice against the equally pressing demand for humanitarian relief when a leader such as Omar al-Bashir has no scruples whatsoever about using innocent, helpless civilians as pawn on, pawns on his political chessboard? How do we keep the world's attention focused on Sudan and South Sudan when the world seems always so eager to rush on, to be able to mark the box, done, checked, finished, and to rush on to the next challenge awaiting them? Our panelists today have not studied this issue from a safe distance. They have lived it, and they are here to share both their personal stories and their analyses of what lies ahead for Sudan and South Sudan. And of course, in keeping with the theme of our summit, their dreams for the future. And I want to leave, of course, as much time as possible for them. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to introduce our first speaker, and then I'll come up between the opening remarks of each of our panelists to introduce them individually. And then when each of our panelists have had the opportunity to share their opening remarks, we hope to have a very lively and engaged discussion. I hope that you will have a lot of questions to bring forward. So let me um, begin by introducing John Dow, um, who I had not previously had the ple pleasure of meeting in person, although of course I knew of him by reputation and I had always looked up to him. But now when I have the chance to actually meet you, John, I realize everybody has to look up to John. It's not just those of us who know of his remarkable um, life story, but everybody has to look up to a man of such stature. John is a human rights activist and founder of the John Dow Foundation, a nonprofit organization with the mission to develop and sustain medical clinics in South Sudan. Born in war-torn Sudan, Dao was one of the 27,000 boys forcibly driven away from his village when the Northern Arab government attacked the ethnic minority population of Southern Sudan in 1987. For the next five years, John led groups of displaced boys across Sudan for hundreds of miles, facing starvation, disease, and violence. In 1992, he was placed in the Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya, where, at 17, he received a basic education. In 2001, John was selected to immigrate to the United States and settled in Syracuse, New York. His harsh journey through Sudan was featured in Christopher Quinn's award-winning documentary, Lost Boys of Sudan. We have asked John to speak about his personal story and to share with us his vision for the future of his nation. Thank you.